he's already started live streaming. He fixed the. the uh, Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Sheen Chapel for today's lecture, A Wedding of Armenian Types, Armenian Customs, Revisiting Garabed Charles Nishanyan's Provincial Wedding in Mush, 1890. My name is Sara Antakelyan, Assistant Director to the Arata Skijan Museum, and on behalf of the museum, I would like to extend our thanks to our patrons and our collaborating partner, National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser, for making today's experience possible. And we thank those um, from Nasser who are with us today. Uh, we would like to begin today's events with a kickoff uh, with a special musical performance by Lilit Nersisyan. Lilith Narcissian was born in 1995 and has been playing music since she was five years old. After graduating from Yerevan Gomidas State Conservatory, she, is, she, continued, she continued her studies in Moscow at the Faculty of Classical Music of the Russian State Academy of Arts. As a flutist, she has participated in many international competitions and received the laureate title and many accolades. She has toured and performed in Europe and Japan and has participated in symphony orchestras and choirs. Currently, she teaches at Sayat Nova Music School in Yerevan, and we are fortunate to have Lilit here with us in Los Angeles to perform three special pieces on the flute. She will per first perform Gomidas' Haberban, Hab second, Aram Khachadurian's Lullaby, and third will conclude with Aram Khachadurian's Girls Dance. Lilit, when you're ready.
That was amazing. Thank you, Ms. Narcisian, for gracing us with a piece of home so elegantly. And thank you. And we're so grateful to have had you with us today. And now I'd like to uh, introduce today's uh, featured speaker, Dr. Vazgen Khachik Davidian. Dr. Davidian is, uh, was formerly a Galus Gulbenkian postdoctoral fellow at the Faculty of Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford. Currently, he is a faculty member of the Faculty of Asian and Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Oxford. He obtained his PhD in art history from Beerbeck College, University of London, in April 2019. His doctoral thesis was entitled Image of the Bantucht Hamal of Constantinople, Late 19th Century Representations of Migrant Workers from Ottoman Armenia. He is currently working on his monograph, Art Realism and the Politics of Social Reform, Reading Late 19th Century Visual Representation of the Armenian Hamal of Constantinople. Today, Dr. Davidian will present a close reading of the painting Provincial Wedding in Mush by the notable but now forgotten Constantinople artist Garabet Charles Nishanyan, 1861 to 1950. Unseen since its last exhibition in Chicago in 1893, the image of this monumental work has survived through a single known photographic reproduction and at least two engravings published in contemporary journals. Moreover, two extensive reviews complement the photograph with a plethora of descriptive detail based on direct visual observation of the painting in the company of the artist. Crucially, they also reveal much about the work's reception among contemporary reformist Ottoman Armenian intellectuals. Dr. Davidian utilizes archival material to examine an important painting replete with ethnographic detail and local color against and to resituate it within the cultural, social, and political historical setting in which it was conceived, executed, displayed, and received. Without further ado, Dr. Davidian, we invite you to tell us more about this special work of art. You can. Wonderful. Um, let me just get rid of these things on the screen because I can't see the... Yeah, yeah, there you go. It's not showing on the screen here, but it's showing on the screen there, sorry. You've done this before, definitely. So, um, hello everyone, thank you so much for coming. I'm so happy to be here. I think this is probably the fourth attempt. Um, we've been sort of, um, we, we sort of conceived this idea just before sort of COVID struck and then sort of obviously it was postponed and postponed and postponed. And, and, um, and here we are, here we are, here we are on a pulpit. pulpit. So that's, 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 that's a first. That's that's and um, also, also thank, thank you. There was a wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful performance. performance. Really, really enjoyed that. And that sort of really, really set the mood as well. well. So, uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so um, I'm, I'm really, really grateful, grateful, especially to Maggie Goshen of the, um, the director of the Arat Eskijan Museum for sort of inviting me and NASA for organizing this event as well. So, um, and I'm really grateful to have been given um, this chance to revisit a painting um, which um, is not only by most accounts visually stunning, um, but which I would designate as a um, groundbreaking cultural and historical document of late 19th century Ottoman Armenian and Ottoman art. As an art historian, my approach involves um, the reading of visual sources, such as paintings, drawings, photographs, engravings, um, but also a number of other mediums that, that um, as you will see, include images on textiles, metalworks, um, etc. Um, and using these images as historical evidence, which in juxtaposition with texts can be used to inform upon the wider context in which um, uh, the work was conceived, created, viewed, circulated, experienced, and received. Um, I therefore engage with visual images in the same way that a historian might interrogate written or printed texts or documents, uh, as opposed to merely treating them as illustrations. Um, so, um, 
a picture is not just a picture. It's not just there to illustrate something. It, it, it can be interrogated in its own right. Um, in this talk, I invite all of you to think of art history as history and the artist as participant and actor in an eyewitness to and, chronicle and chronicler of that history. Um, so allow me to introduce the image. Okay, it's moved here, but it hasn't moved over there. These technical glitches always happen, so please bear with us. So, okay. this one, I think. It's working there. Yeah, being an Apple user, I'm completely out of my depth when it comes to PCs, so apologies. Aha, here we are. We've got the image. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, Armenian wedding in Mush. So, as the title suggests, the presentation, this presentation shall focus on a single image document, an album and photographic print of a painting representing a traditional wedding in Ottoman Armenia, no larger than 22 times 28.7 centimeters. So it's about that size. It is a black and white sepia photograph of a large painting, which basically measures approximately 1.5 to 2 meters, um, the whereabouts of which are currently unknown. Um, captioned Armenian Provincial Wedding in Mush, Mushokaba Agan Hasnik, by the once celebrated but now mostly forgotten Constantinople artist Garabet Charles Nishanyan. I came across photographs some 10 years ago whilst conducting research for my doctoral thesis in the archives of the AGBU Nubar Library in Paris, and which, for those of you not familiar with it, is the most important repository of archival material, an absolute treasure trove of documents on the late Ottoman Armenian experience in Western Europe. Um, the photograph is in, a is in a landscape format with its lower left-hand corner torn. See over there. Um, the, work um, the work of a photographer whose, whose name remains, remains unrecorded. unrecorded. It is perhaps, perhaps one of a handful, handful in existence. It would, it would have been produced for the artist to serve as documentary and archival record of the painting before its sale, a visual aid for prospective clients, or as template for mediated publication such as engraving, or for the reproduction of the image in a newspaper or journal. The photograph depicts a painting which represents a crowd in the process of pouring into a large, rustic, and mostly sparse room with high ceilings. Through a central doorway, the unmistakable conical dome of an Armenian church in the distance, from where the celebrants are arriving, can just about be discerned. On either side of the door, the triangular timber pediments above two blind windows evoke classical architectural forms. A large runner, a pile rug, um, and assorted woven grass mats cover the floor space. The various objects, such as earthenware and other everyday implements that have been pleasingly arranged and displayed, exude an atmosphere of theatricality and rustic charm. The impression of a stage set seeking to demonstrate exotic customs and traditions is reinforced by Nishanyan's arrangement of an ethnographic parade of 17 women and men attired in the native garb of the Mush region of Ottoman Armenia in the eastern armeno kurdish peripheries of the Ottoman Empire. In the absence of Nishanyan's original painting, it is ultimately the photograph that has ensured the survival of the image, albeit in a mediated form. It is the photograph that we must rely upon to interrogate the image. Yet we are fortunate that the photograph can be examined alongside and in parallel with contemporary texts by two intellectual acquaintances of the artist, the influential activist editor of the popular reformist newspapers Arevelk and from 1891 Hayrenik, the writer Arpiar Arpiarian, who was the high priest or godfather of Constantinople Armenian realism, um, also known as the Borsa Hayrabash Serunt in Armenian, and his close associate, the realist author and critic Levon Pashalian. So here we have um, the images of the, of, the, of the suspects. So we have Arpiar Arpiarian, Levon Pashalian, and a self portrait of um, Charles Garabet Nishanyan. Um, and that's probably the only image of Nishanyan that we actually have. I've never been able to come across another image of the artist. 
Arpiarian and Pashalyan were probably among the first and among the few to have seen the painting in Constantinople in 1890, and their unusually detailed and descriptive reviews of the work become indispensable in helping overcome um, some of the handicaps that would uh, necessarily inhibit our visual analysis. For experiencing handling a photograph is completely different to sort of experiencing and then viewing a, a large painting. For example, sort of you know in terms of size, um, in terms of color, we don't really know what colors we're actually used in this in this in this in this image, and we can't really see the brushstrokes of the painting just by looking at the photograph. Um, um, so, so they, they complement our experience and our understanding of the image by introducing additional layers of observed details and insight gained from their close proximity, access to, and direct engagement with both the original painting and Nishanyan himself. Hence, through a close reading of image alongside contemporary texts, we hope to give some shape to the intellectual and artistic, but also the social and political environment and conditions that gave birth to the painting, shaped its circulation and its reception. So let's begin with the opening lines of Pashalyan's response to the painting. And I quote, So um, I've just included the first paragraph and I think the final paragraph of Pashalyan's um, review of the painting. It's a full page review, which is really unusual for 1890 Constantinople Armenian newspapers to devote almost a whole page of a newspaper to a review of a single painting. So Pashalyan sort of notes. In recent days, we had the opportunity to view a painting that presents an Armenian provincial wedding. The work of the well-known painter Garabet Effendi and Shanyan, which is on display in one of the rooms at the Kostigian Frères in the Oriental Bazaar in Bolis. In Bolis. Bolis is Armenian for Constantinople. Um, I saw that, that painting with admiration, wonderment, and an enjoyment equally of the eye and the heart, and I consider it my duty to render others partakers in the boundless satisfaction um, and the kind of national community, he uses the term Askain, pride, that Nishanyan Effendi's beautiful talent inspires in us. End of quote. It is with these words that Pashalyan, writing under the pseudonym Tapari, Wanderer, opens what is an uncharacteristically lengthy and detailed review of the painting published in the popular daily Arabelk on the 28th of July, 1890, under the title A Provincial Wedding, Kavaragan Nikma. He then proceeds to guide the reader through the work. This is a monumental painting of two meters width and one and a half meters height, presenting a scene from a provincial wedding where the priest, bride, and groom, the best man, the village headman, relatives and friends, in total a party of 18 souls, are returning from church. Um, I think he's miscounted because I've counted it several times and I could only find 17, 17 people, but um, unless I'm missing something... I think it's I think 17. It's 17. Um, um, so, so um, um, unless, um, um, sorry, sorry. On, the on the first plane, plane of the painting appears the conductor of the wedding, the wedding then the, the groom, groom wearing, wearing a chasuble, chasuble and, and a Bible, Bible in hand. hand. Behind, Behind him, him, the godfather, godfather the, best the best man, man holding, holding a spear with an apple impaled at its point, point. and together the brother, the bride, and the two sisters of the bride, the bride's face covered with an Armenian veil, while one sister's face is uncovered and she is of more advanced years. The peasant priest in a white beard advances, worry beads in hand, and behind him stand two strong young lads playing the drum, and two other men who are dancing, one crying out an exclamation of joy, Nagara Kashel, or in Turkish it's Nagara Çekmek. Um, it's a kind of sort of uh, singing. The picture presents a spacious hall with straw mats covering the floor. Two strings of onions are hanging from the ceiling. On this side. Um, there, is there is a jug, a jug and two and cups, cups on a shelf. shelf. In the distance, the dome of the church is visible, surrounded by a blue expanse of sky, while, the distance appears, while in the distance appears the city with its castle. So reproducing this experience is a really, really useful exercise um, because um, some of the things that we can't really see from the photograph he's already sort of presenting. For example, we can't really see the castle in the background or the blue sky, etc. So that's, that's really, really interesting information for us. So a month before the publication of Pashalyan's article on 28th of June, another, um, another review entitled Letter from Constantinople discussing Nishanyan's 
um, recently completed wedding had already been published in the popular liberal Russian Armenian newspaper Mashag Cultivator uh, in Tiflis, in, 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 in the Russian Empire. The author of this article, writing under the pseudonym Haigag, was Arpiarian. Um, as correspondent of the newspaper in Constantinople. So he notes, two weeks ago I was shown a photograph that presented a few Armenian bantorts, among whom was a priest. The photograph was devoid of light, where only a few faint lines were, were discernible. It was a photograph of a picture Badger, by Nishanyan, they said. It represents a wedding in Mush. I expressed the wish to go and see the painting. So the painting, but the photograph is called the Badger. So, um, the reference, the reference to Bantorts, Bantorts um, needs a bit of sort of um, introduction. Um, um, these, are these are basically mostly migrant, migrant workers, mostly young men who uh, moved from the provinces of Ottoman Armenia and, and, and worked in large numbers on the streets of Constantinople. Um, a lot of them worked as Hamas porters. So, they're really, really visible on the street in their sort of um, local sort of Meshetsi sort of garb. So, most of these men were actually from Mosh, from, or from the, not the city of Mosh, but from the wider region. Of, 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 of Mosh. So, um, so in a way, you could basically, there was a, you could, um, you could view Armenia and its poverty on the streets of Constantinople through viewing these, these, these figures. So back to Arpiaria. His tone is somewhat surprising as it suggests that he had only then and indirectly come across Nishanyan's painting. Yet almost three and a half years earlier, in late 1886, during a conversation with the artist, probably at Nishanyan's studio at 31 Tepevashi in Pashtabu Pera, in the European part of Constantinople, the young artist had confided in him of having embarked upon a canvas which sought to represent a traditional army in wedding. Arpiarian had reported this exchange in the closing paragraph of his um, column, Daily Life, or Rangyang, under the caption on the occasion of a painting, Bat Gevi Maartif, published in Arevelk on the 29th of November 1886. Writing under yet another nom de plume, Harastan, he had noted, We, by, he means Nishanyan and I, rendezvous for the day when he will exhibit in public a wedding with Armenian types, Armenian customs, towards the realization of which he contemplates, thinks, toils, and dreams." End of quote. Arpiarian's enthusiastic response to Nishanyan's idea, um, we don't really know whether he was actually shown any sketches, he doesn't mention that at all, um, of a painting of an Armenian wedding in 1886 is palpable. Once he had seen the work, uh, in 1890. Arpi Aryan described it as large-scale, Laina Zaval, as a large-scale Laina Zaval painting of a wedding of Mosh, Mushi Hasnik. A wonderful attempt where joyfulness, Zvartutuna, and the pensive gaiety, Chohun Zvartutuna, upon everyone's face were the dominating color on the canvas. Arpi Aryan congratulates the artist for directing his greatest skill into the rendering of the expressiveness of these men's and women's gazes. His enthusiasm is understandable. After all, he was a leading proponent of the important role of painting as an ally to social reformist realist literature that sought to represent life as it is, Gyanka Inchpesvore. He encouraged Constantinople Armenian artists to go to the streets, the Huns, the inns, and the slums where the Bantos lived, worked, or congregated, to accurately and truthfully capture their lives and show their works with a view to soften and change sneering urban hearts and minds. Basically, the Istanbul Armenians look down on these um, Bantos. Um, he also encouraged the city's Armenian artists to exhibit their works widely. In the above quote, Arpiarian explicitly anticipates the public exhibition of Nishanyan's painting in a prestigious location, such as a shop or department store window in Pera. Nishanyan's rendering of a celebratory wedding scene with Armenian types and customs and showcasing a wealth of ethnographic color would be the talk of the town, as it would undoubtedly speak to the sensibilities of the city's fashionable alafranga or westernized elites and circles and foreign residents and visitors alike. So today we um, associate this kind of imagery with, 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 ma with mainly Western so-called Orientalist paintings. So you can sort of imagine what Arpiarian was, was, was really sort of thinking about. Furthermore, it is significant that Nishanyan had situated his wedding scene in provincial Mush. 
for this ambitious and monumental painting would present a positive view of the Hayastansi, as the Bantus were called, they were called Hayastansis, the Armenian peasant from Ottoman Armenia in Ottoman Armenia, a place from, from where only sad news of violence, plunder and pillage, poverty and persecution reached the capital. Let's not forget that this was about 10 years after um, uh, a dozen, a dozen years, years after, after the, the Russo-Ottoman War of 1877-1878. So um, there was a lot of, it was a very tense political environment. So um, let us briefly at this point step back from Nishanyan's um, wedding and ask, considering the vantage point of these artists and intellectuals in 1886 and 1890, or 1890, how was Armenia represented in the visual arts, uh, specifically painting? So, so what, what was, was Armenia, Armenia in those days? days? I mean, it was I very mean, much a nebulous, nebulous concept, concept for a lot of them. them. But for, for Nishanyan's contemporaries, um, um, when they, they talked about Armenia, Armenia they, they always talked about Ottoman Armenia. Ottoman Armenia. They, they always talked about Turkahayastan. So, so um, basically, Van, Mush, um, Erzrum, up to Sepastia, etc. That was described as Turkahayastan um, or Hayastan. Whereas, Whereas across, across the frontier, frontier um, Russian, Russian Armenia, Armenia was usually um, described as Govgas. So, so when we talk, we talk about, about Armenia, Armenia, in this, in this particular, particular context, we're referring to Ottoman Armenia. Armenia. So, so how, how did, did Armenian, Armenian artists, artists produce the image, image of Armenia? Of Armenia? One influential image that predominates from the middle of the 19th century onwards and encapsulates the sense of how Armenia was, per, uh, was perceived by a transnational Armenian public is based upon a visual romantic allegory conceived by the Italian artist and engraver Michele Fanoli. He lived between 1807 and 1876 and he was um, a one-time art teacher at the Mkhitaris Muradian School in Paris during the 1840s. And, um, and um, he, produced he produced this image seemingly at the invitation of the Archbishop, Archbishop Gabriel Ivazovsky, brother of the famous Crimean Armenian, Armenian, Armenian seascape um, artist Hovannes Ivan Ivazovsky. So um, the original image basically depicts an allegorical um, sort of, uh, figure of a woman sitting among the ruins of Armenia. Um, you can see Mount Ararat, uh, Mount Ararat in the background. And um, sort of Armenia is abandoned. Um, everyone's um, you know, left. Uh, for Bantuk to tune, um, abandonment, etc. So um, this image was began to be disseminated in print from the 1850s. And I think the first copies were printed in Paris in 1855. Um, as you can see from the examples presented here, it had become ubiquitous throughout the second half of the 19th century and beyond, reproduced in diverse mediums. For example, here we see a carpet. Um, uh, some metalwork. Apparently, that, uh, that's an engagement box. Um, but also a book cover on, um, on a book on the Bantok, the life of the Bantok, that was published in 1876 by um, Hachmerian, in which Bantok Tutun, basically abandoning Armenia to go to um, Constantinople to work, uh, is regarded as a sin. And Hachmerian divides the Bantok into three different categories good, Okay, okay and, terrible. and terrible. So, so obviously, obviously the good, good bantoths always returned back home. home. Um, um, the, the, those those bantoths were sort of passable, sort of send money home. home. Um, but the bad the ones were the ones who disappeared, who never sent any money to their families, and they never sort of came back. So, um, these, this is basically um, Armenia, Mother Armenia. Sometimes she's referred to as Mother Armenia, but Armenia among the ruins is. is um, is the, the dominant image, image of Armenia, Armenia of the, of the second, second half of the 19th, 19th century. century. So, so much, much of 19th century, 19th century imagery of Armenia, Armenia as, as a landscape, landscape as a place, place was, captured was captured by Russian, Russian Armenian, Armenian artists, artists, not Ottoman, Ottoman Armenian, Armenian artists. artists. These, These represent, represent noted landmarks such as Mount Ararat, Ararat Lake Sevan, Mount Arakats, etc., all in Russian Armenia. Some of the best known among them also simultaneously engage with allegory and the mythical. For example, these examples by, uh, produced by Ivazovsky. Um, of course, Ivazovsky had never set foot in Armenia. He went as far as Tiflis, but he never actually went to Armenia. So he would have basically produced um, the image of, of Ararat um, from um, other paintings that he'd seen or other images. And um, one's the mythical story of, of Noah descending um, the mountain. And the other one is... Um, even in his Even lifetime, lifetime, he was a mythical sort of figure, Khabim Yan Hayrik. So Khabim Yan Hayrik is, is, is standing there, and, and he's surrounded by, by a flock of sheep. And of course, we can all imagine what, what, what this sort of um, symbolism, what, what this symbolizes. So this is a particular type of image of Armenia that was out there. 
Um, other Russian Armenians, who unlike Ivazovsky, had traveled in Transcaucasian or Russian Armenia and had first-hand experience of its physical terrain, included the brilliant Valkis Serenyan, one of his images right here as well, um, and his contemporary Gerald Bashinjarian. So, uh, of course, none of these images would have been seen uh, or exhibited in Constantinople, and of course they're produced at the very end of the 19th century, so um, artists in Constantinople would not have seen these images at all. So, um, what, what images, images of Armenia then were being produced by Ottoman Armenian artists, artists who were in their majority based in the larger Western, Western cities of the Ottoman Empire, Empire particularly Constantinople? Constantinople. From, From what, what I can, I can tell, tell um, um, we would have to wait until 1899, 1899 and the earliest years of the 20th century, 20th century to see the production, production and circulation of a series of watercolors depicting, depicting the ruined churches and, and fortifications of the medieval Armenian, Armenian capital of Ani, situated, situated once, once again, again since 1878, 1878 in Russian, Russian Armenia. Armenia. These were sketched in plein air by the Trebizond-born Ashak Vedvajan, the first graduate of the Imperial Fine Art Academy of Constantinople who had, by 1906, published a selection of these images as postcards. And, and that's the cover of the postcard collection, and that's one of the images. So you can see ruined um, churches of Ani, you can see the walls of Ani. So this is another kind of image of Armenia as a sort of a ruined land that sort of predominates. Um, again, we would have to wait until 1914 and 1915 for the Vanetsi Ottoman Armenian artist Panos Terlemezian to travel across uh, the Lake Van region in Ottoman Armenia with his sketchbook. Unfortunately, the vast majority of his works, uh, the sketches and finished paintings, were lost or destroyed in 1915 in the immediate aftermath of the self-defense of Van and during the retreat to Russian Armenia. One rare and miraculous survivor that, that provides, provides us, us only with a glimpse of what Telemezian must have created during these years is a magnificent landscape painting, Man Sipan and Lake Van from Gudnut Island, which is in the National Gallery in Armenia. And um, as a side, I, I can see several faces with whom uh, we actually stood at, the, at that very point and looked at Man Sipan in 2019, uh, in the summer of 2019. So um, it's a particularly special painting for me. Now, an exception, once again, executed perhaps two decades after Nishanyan's wedding, are the series of naive paintings of bucolic scenes of rural bliss with peasants at work in the fields um, or at rest produced by Sarkis der Azaria, an artist from Izmit, a town to the east of the Marmara Sea, not far from Constantinople. Six of these were published as a series of postcards under the title Village Life in Armenia. This title, however, is misleading as the scenes represent village life among the communities of North e northwestern Anatolia, a region with a very large Armenian population since the 17th century. That particular region was almost a third Armenian before the genocide. So that the series is titled Armenia raises very interesting questions of, of how the term Armenia was actually um, understood. Considering an absence of visual imagery of Armenia, of Ottoman, Ottoman Armenia, Armenia, as the as term was understood, understood by intellectuals in Constantinople in the 1880s and 1890s, and that and all the images that we have seen, seen the allegories, allegories, the landscapes, and the ruins, Nishanyan's ambitious painting, painting set in Mush, is, is, a truly, is truly, truly radical, radical for its time and place. place. Of course, it was, not the, uh, it was not the first Ottoman Armenian artist to refer explicitly to the region. Works by two Constantinople artists, Bedros Sarabian, surviving Armenian beggar from Van, and Armenian girl from Paresh, is the first two paintings on this side. Um, the whereabouts of the um, Armenian girl from Paresh is unknown, and that image um, appears in the 1928 edition of Teotik's Amen and Daryatutsa, Everyone's Almanac. That's how we actually know of the image. And Simon Hagopian's Beggar Woman from Van, from 1889, and perhaps even um, an undated painting, Meshet Sihamal, um, predate the wedding in explicitly uh, citing Ottoman Armenia in their captions. Whilst realist in execution, the evidence shows that several of these works were read by contemporaries as allegorical personifications of Armenia and its suffering. A comparison, a comparison of the wedding to this painting, to this portrait, intimated size in Hagopian's case, and not very large in the case of, Sarabia, in, of, in the case of Sarabian's paintings, underlines the novelty of Nishanyan's monumental tableau with its, with its cast, cast of multiple, multiple characters, characters, the beating heart of which is a young veiled bride from Mush. 
Nishanyan's wedding, perhaps the most ambitious canvas of the late 19th century um, by an Ottoman, let alone Ottoman Armenian artist, radically and dramatically departs from the subtly allegorizing portraiture of mainly single, destitute Bantorts in order to imagine and represent an Ottoman Armenia on a hitherto unknown massive scale. So, so who was Nishanyan? I mean, why, why would he, would he sort, of sort of do this painting? painting? And, and again, again, we see um, Nishanyan's um, self-portrait self -portrait and the painting. painting. Our, knowledge Our knowledge of the, of the artist, artist, a native, native of Constantinople, of Constantinople is, 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 is at is best fragmentary. fragmentary. Very, Very few works, few works uh, by Nishanyan, at best perhaps two dozen, are known or are in the public domain. So it's, it's quite incredible that Teotik, who writes about most Ottoman Armenian artists, doesn't make a mention of Garabin Nishanyan at all. His artistic and intellectual worldview had been firmly grounded in Western European academic training. Um, firstly, in Constantinople, as one of the first students of Pierre Desiré Guillemet's Académie de Dessin um, et de Peinture, and later in Naples at the Reale Accademia di Belle Arti between 1877 and 1882 under Italian artists Filippo Palizzi and especially Domenico Morelli. And Morelli was particularly influential um, in Nishanyan's art, from what we can see. His return to Constantinople had coincided with a historical moment when realism established its dominance over the city's Armenian cultural milieu for the next decade and beyond. Mentions in the Constantinople press between 1886 and 1894 attest his proximity and intellectual affinity with intellectuals such as Arpiarian and Pashinyan. By 1890, when he completed the wedding, Nishanyan was already a well-established and celebrated artist and a much, thought, sought, a much sought after society portraitist in Constantinople. Yet like the above mentioned um, Sirabian and Hagopian, but also Pashalian and Arpiarian, Nishanyan had never set foot in Ottoman Armenia, a distant land that most Constantinople intellectuals had never seen, yet imagined vividly and felt close to due in part to the abundance of accessible material. The systematic collection and prolific publication of diverse um, ethnographic, antiquarian, historical, linguistic and other material, including songs, dances, oral histories and customs from across um, Ottoman Armenia and other Armenian inhabited regions would have provided um, an urban Constantinople artist, intellectual like Nishanyan with ample material. The priest and ethnographer, uh, Bishop Karikin Servantsidians, had viewed the peasantry and the folklore as natural a part of Armenia as the land's flora and fauna. An ethnographic spirit imbued with romanticism and religious sensibility is evident, is evident everywhere in Sivan Sidyan's prolific output, such as in his volumes Manana and Hamov Hodov, um, published in Constantinople in 1876 and 1884 respectively, that also included numerous samples of wedding songs and dances. Bishop Servant who had between 1863 and 65 edited a bi-weekly journal, Alzvik Daranov, um, The Eaglet of Daron, at the printing press established at St. Garabed Monastery near Mush, is unparalleled as a mid to late 19th century source on the region. During this period, studies in journals, including the Bechitaris Pazmaveb, uh, published in Venice, recorded and disseminated a wealth of ethnographic material. In the commercial, the commercial press, too, articles such as H.M. Dudukhian's series, Life in Armenia, Hayastani Gyank, published in Aravog in at least 12 independent parts between August 1887 and April 1888, are just one example of the diverse aspects of the life of the Ottoman Armenian provincial peasant, traditions, medicine, economy, womanhood, spirituality, etc., that were made available to its Constantinople readership. In addition, numerous published texts and travel accounts also provided a treasure trove of topographical, archaeological, architectural and historical observation and information. In order to comprehend the significance of Nishanyan's deliberate selection of Mush as the imagined location of the wedding, for the wedding, one must consider the region's central position in the literary reorientation and ethnographic turn towards Ottoman Armenia. Throughout the second half of the 19th century, a wealth of information on the town, its environs, and the surrounding region were available to Constantinople intellectual elites and the educated public. An extensive report by an author writing under the pseudonym N, Correspondences of Arevelk, the Plain of Mush, Tertak Tsutyunk, Tertak Tsutyunk, Arevelki, Meshotasht, 
published in Arevelk um, in March 1884, based on two years of travel across the region in 1882 and 1883, encapsulates the importance of the plain of Mush for Ottoman Armenian intellectual elites. And I quote, it was in this plain that in the past were situated a great many of the, pagan, of, of the pagan Armenians and as are today Christian Armenians' holiest and most sacred sites. These include the most glorious monastery, the feudal fief of the Illuminator, St. Garabed by name, and the third holiest among religious sites, um, after Holy Echmiadzin and St. Hagop in Jerusalem. Uh, so Garabed was the third holiest sort of site. Um, uh, uh, for, for the Armenian Orthodox. Despite, Despite troubles, troubles, massacres, massacres and, pillaging, and pillaging, the Plain of Mush is still home to no fewer than 100,000 inhabitants, of whom 80,000 are Armenians and the remainder Turkish and Kurdish Muslims. Of its 120 villages, 90 are Armenian inhabited and 30 inhabited by others. End of quote. So the author establishes the centrality of Mush as eternal Armenia, the timeless center of its pre-Christian and Christian shrines in the Armenian historical imagination. Countering official designations of the region by the Abdul Hamid II regime as Kurdistan in the aftermath of the Russo Ottoman War of 1877-1878, he connects past and present, presenting a land continually inhabited by hardy Christian Armenian villagers who had clung, clung on to their um, ancient, uh, ancient and ancestral, ancestral highlands, highlands despite, despite massacre, massacre, forced conversion, and plunder. Important, important to Armenian historical memory as the birthplace of saints and warriors, this was the hereditary fiefdom of the house of Krikor the Illuminator, passing through marriage after 438 in the Christian era to the house of the Mamigonians, hereditary commanders-in-chief, the Sparabets, to the royal army, and heroes and defenders of the faith. It was the ancient province of Daron and the birthplace of Mesrop Mashkos, the inventor of the Armenian alphabet. So the region of Mush had remained a kind, uh, a land of monasteries and pilgrimage. Um, uh, in the cartographer Robert Husen's um, historical atlas of Armenia, I think he counts at least 25 major monasteries in, 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 in the Mush region. Daron was accepted as the cradle of Christianity in the country and the part of Armenia where the earliest missionaries had arrived from Syria. Tradition records that the monastery of St. Garabed, the holy precursor, Ottoman Armenia's holiest religious shrine, revered in the popular imagination as Mushur Sultan Sub Garabed, um, had been erected on the site of the holiest pagan temple of Ashtishad in classical Armenia. Meanwhile, romanticizing and idealizing the primitiveness, as they call them, of the locals, dwellings and lifestyle, N praised the author called N, um, or signing as N, praised the Moshetsi's preservation of ancient Armenian dress and language, concluding that, I quote, Armenians of only a few places have maintained as many Armenian traditions as the Moshetsi's, end of quote. And of course, primitive carried associations with purity and simplicity that contrasted Constantinople Armenians supposedly Turkified or westernized Alafranga habits. In the author's mind, these Armenian peasants clinging to their way of life on the plain of Mush had remained untainted by either the Ottoman Empire or the West and retained an essential spirit of an unbroken tradition and civilization. Weddings were an important part of the 19th century ethnographic literary interest in Ottoman Armenia. And the wealth of information and detail published in the Ottoman Armenian press would have provided, as we said, ample material for Nishanyan. Um, interestingly, we don't really have that many um, visual images of, of Armenian weddings. Um, one of the very few ones that I, I could come up with was um, produced in the 18th century by the Dutch painter Van Moor. Um, it was an Armenian wedding procession uh, taking uh, place in Constantinople. He did a series of them. There's a Greek wedding procession, there's a Muslim wedding procession, and he did an Armenian one as well. So we don't really have that many paintings in this particular period of Armenian weddings, which is quite surprising because if you really want to showcase tradition and, 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 and wonderful costumes, etc., I mean, it is a natural subject to deal with. Um, um, for example, for example, the highly informative study, study wedding, wedding ceremony, ceremony in the in province, province of Mush, so looking, looking at some, at some um, kind, kind of information that would have been available to Nishan Yang, published Hantes Hasanyad's Mush Khabarin Mech, published in Pazmaveb in 1867, provides a fascinating early example of this ethnographic turn, while also revealing fascinating insights into the nature and extent of armeno kurdish cultural interaction and cross-pollination of this specific region. 
Hence we learn, for example, that the groom was referred to as a takvor. Takavor means king. His unmarried friends were known as Azab, and Azab is, is a, comes from the Arabic word meaning um, celibate single bachelor man. Um, their leader, often the best man, uh, was known as the Khachakbayr, the cross brother, and uh, doubled as the Azab Bashi, so is the head of the Azabs. Um, and the takvor ceremonial headwear called the Vartabasak Tak, rose wreathed crown, contained multicolored golden roses shaped out of non precious metallic tin. Queen is Queen Voskiti Terneve, Shinbad Zvarter. Which the Khachakbar, alongside the bodyguards selected from the Azab, had a duty to defend and, and prevent from being stolen by force if need be. So while examining the, the above information, we can be forgiven for imagining that Nashanyan's wedding was produced to illustrate all this sort of ethnographic detail, to show this ethnographic detail. And this, despite the occasional contradictions to Pashalyan's or Nishanyan's assumptions. For example, the two women on either side of, of the bride would not have been the bride's sisters, but the closest female relatives of the groom also responsible for dressing the bride, known by the Kurdish term Berbuk, Berbukner. The wedding represents an Armenia as imagined by Nishanyan, but also informed by the painstaking research undertaken by the artist in order to achieve a truthful, in his mind, image of a traditional Armenian wedding in Mush. With the abundant availability of information, Nishanyan and his fellow elite Constantinople intellectuals would never have needed to endure the physical hardships of late 19th century travel to and within Ottoman Armenia, a land with few roads, even less infrastructure, a land of economic deprivation, violence, and political instability, to be able to, to imagine the land and its people intimately. Furthermore, any abstract conceptualization of Ottoman Armenia had a powerful material counterpart, the very real physical manifestation on the streets of the imperial capital embodied in the form of the Hayasansi, and these were the Bantuls. Thus, Nishanyan would never have had to set foot outside Constantinople to observe um, the women and men he would represent in his wedding, as Constantinople was awash with thousands of Bantuls from Ottoman Armenia. By the 1880s and well into the mid-1890s, Bantuks from the plain of Mush appeared in disproportionate numbers on the streets of Constantinople, particularly among the Hamals and other menial professions of a low social status. This would also explain, to a great degree, why it was the Meshetsis over other natives of Armenia who had captured the imagination of Ottoman Armenian artists in the city, and of course other intellectuals too, at the time. Um, so they, pre they predominate the portraits of, of, of Armenians uh, produced by these Ottoman artists, as we actually saw um, earlier in this painting. Um, they're all Venet uh, Meshetsis. The interesting thing is that um, a, a lot of... Um, uh, the, more uh, the more dignified, dignified images are of Meshetsis, but the beggars, but the, the beggars are always Vanetsis, they're always from Van. So I've not been able to understand why the, van, uh, the beggars are always a beggar from Van, but the Hamas are always, we know why the Hamas are from Mush, but you know, the beggars from Van. I mean, it may have to do something with the, um, great, um, um, the great famine of Van in 1881, 1882, when Armenia couldn't really feed itself. So, um, and that's basically when Bedros Srabian produced uh, uh, this allegorical uh, painting, the Armenian beggar from Van, in a way, showing, showing that Armenia cannot sort of feed itself. So, so back, back onto back onto back our, our image. image. Okay, 16. So it was among it was from among this abundant pool of mainly men, but also increasingly women, that Nashanyan had selected his authentic Hayasansi types. Pashalyan, who along with um, Arpiarian had no doubt of the painting's truthfulness. So it's a realist painting. It's all about truthfulness. It's about showing life as it is, um, at least in their minds. Confirms that every, and I quote, every likeness depicted upon the canvas is that of a bantu. So every single person was, was uh, sought out and, and sketched. And so every single image, every single person um, represents a real person out there. And that and the, the artist had searched for higher sansi types in every corner of the capital. So, so I quote from Pashalyan. In order to accurately execute the true to type character of those provincial faces, to reproduce with perfect truthfulness the expressiveness of all the items of clothing, of all the costumes, of all the wedding items and furniture, with a 
local color, Nishanyan Effendi has ungrudgingly taken upon himself to suffer all the troubles expected of an artist of conscience searching every corner of our capital to seek out all the types that could best suit his purpose. Defeating these provincials naturally inborn untrustworthiness and instinctual unwillingness. By all means, by convincing and beseeching the provincial women to come and sit opposite him, to pose for hours to serve as models. And yet, the result has amply rewarded all his labors. For the artist, the excessive fatigue and the endured anxieties, the trials of inspiration and execution have all paid, paid off for the work. His creation is there before him, gay and joyful, and already all the artist's toil has been forgotten. End of quote. Now, this is a very interesting quote. Um, it's exceptionally revealing for beyond providing much welcome information concerning Nishanyan's working uh, practices, how he actually went into the Huns and he sketched uh, the Bantoks, etc. It is, of course, um, unsurprising that his selection of the models for the purpose of sketching would have been based upon his own preconceptions of who constituted the suitable Hyacinthi type. So he, there's a selection going on there of who looks Hyacinthi and who doesn't. Um, it also, this, this text exposes deeply held preconceptions and stereotypical beliefs an intra-community orientalization of Hayastansis among the urban, westernized, and social reformist intellectuals of the Constantinople realist generation, uh, the Bosahai Rabash Sewund. Reading Pashalyan's and Arpiyan's reviews of the wedding, the presence of much that is contradictory and dissonant in their authors' attitudes towards rural provisions becomes um, abundantly clear. Pashalian's, Pashalian's attribution of the epithet provincial to the wedding and its participants already makes explicit the reviewer's and artist's vantage point, that of urban para from where Ottoman Armenia is perceived as a distant peripheral land, um, a rural outpost, it's, it's, it's us versus them. So juxtaposing Nishanyan's self-portrait, but also think about Arpiyan's and Pashalian's photographs that we saw earlier. Um, with the painting of, of the wedding um, helps bring to the fore the artist's particular fascination with the otherness of the Hayastansi. The otherness is reinforced by the studied and rigid, rigid um, traditionalism and the native dress of the depicted men and women in antithesis to the artist's own relaxed Western attire. Considering his representation of, of a nostalgic idealized, idealized view of what a traditional Armenian wedding would resemble, um, in um, which he has rendered his subjects' membership of a distinct ethno-religious group explicit through costume and religious symbolism and has resisted any sign of modernity. In contrast um, to the manner in which he has represented himself, reinforces in stark relief differences of us and them. For presenting differences um, in attire as, indi as indicative of a more deeply rooted difference, Nishanyan has constructed a chasm, a chasm between um, the urban modern bourgeois himself and the eternal idealized exoticized peasant in her or his imagined rural provincial homeland. The art historian Mary Roberts has rightly observed that late 19th century Ottoman self-portraiture has, uh, has rightly observed that um, late 19th century Ottoman self-portraiture portraiture as providing the most in and I quote um, the most intimate insights into how artists perceive themselves um, and their practices as modern artists in a period and a location where the cultural category was in formation. Thus, in his only known self-portrait, signed in March Constantinople 1894, and in the collection, luckily, of the National Gallery of Armenia in Yerevan today, Nishanyan has offered a rare and intimate glimpse of how a successful and highly respected Ottoman Armenian artist had chosen to self-represent. His direct gaze and confident smile, visible through a luxurious moustache, is a self-projection of a confident and optimistic man, understandably happy with the critical and commercial success he was enjoying. Um, at this point, there were poems being published in the Ottoman Armenian press, uh, sort of praising him. Um, one poem calls him the new Ivazovsky, even though we don't know any seascapes painted by Nishanyan, but you know, so he was really highly regarded. He was really, really celebrated. So Nishanyan's casual sporting of European attire with a collar loosely undone and shirt unbuttoned reflects the informality of the painting. 
as does a stripy civilian cloth cap uh, with a small visor, fashionable in the 1890s, which does not match the jacket. In this surviving self-portrait, Nishanyan has sought to represent himself as a late 19th century westernized urban modern Ottoman man with a, with a gentle whiff of the bohemian. The large moustache and casual cap can be read as interesting signifiers of, of East and West respectively. Meanwhile, the artist's idealized representation of the machetes and prejudices are reinforced in Alpiarian's and Pashalian's reviews of Nishanyan's, pain, uh, of Nishanyan's wedding. Reading their words and descriptions, one senses an explicit attraction to words, but also fear of the provincial other that attributes, that attributes a degree of agency to the, uh, agency to the higher sancy, yet simultaneously exposes the author's fascination with imagined essential values and traits, such as purity, modesty, uh, and raw masculine physical strength that they, as urban Constantinople Armenians, believe they had lost. Their strongly gendered attitudes towards the migrant provincial encompassing idealization. Terms like sinless purity, physical strength, uprightness, erect bodies, pride, so blatant sexualization, uh, plump figures, references to bosoms and eloquent faces, ridicule, infantilization and vilification such as untrustworthiness, laziness, but also dirtiness and poor hygiene, stupidity, ignorance, recall abundant counterparts on the pages of the contemporary, contemporary Constantinople Armenian press. So as, as um, sort of, uh, I don't want to take too much more time, I just really like here to sort of focus on one particular part of the painting, which I think is probably the most important part of the painting, at least in my mind. So, and I think that is the, um, it, is, it is the image of the um, young Mushetsi uh, bride. So, so she's, she's at the center of the, of, of the, of the painting, painting and, and all eyes, eyes are basically drawn, drawn to her. her. On the lowest on the rung of the patriarchal hierarchy, hierarchy despite being a figure of hope from whom new life would spring, she is at the mercy of patrilocal tradition. So she's about to leave her father's home for that of her new husbands, leaving her open to gender rivalries, being mistreated by women of her new family under the not always very kind eye of her mother-in-law, and being allocated the most menial of tasks. Is Nishanyan's bride anxious or apprehensive? How old is she? Is she a 12-year-old child, uh, child bride being married to a slightly older boy who is about to leave for Constantinople in search of work? Arpiarian notes that nothing can be discerned on her face, while Pashalian claims to detect a blush on her face. Um, I'm not sure about that. I mean, the veil would have been red, so, um, so you know, maybe there is a blush on her face, but, but Armenian brides in that particular region actually wore sort of red veils. So um, the sadness in tone of their discussion when they start discussing the bride. There's, there's a sadness to their, uh, to their tone. Um, it is uh, perhaps underscored by the awareness that on the plain of Mush, young girl brides were at the great risk of abduction by Kurdish Ashwits, Kurdish tribespeople, with any resistance most often leading to death. So submission and forced conversion institutionalized rape under cover of marriage to, to these girls' abductors. So remember where we are, we're in 1890. Perhaps, Perhaps no, no educated, educated Ottoman Armenian viewer, viewer in 1890, general, general Armenian public, public too, too, could fail, fail to make, make the connection, connection between Nishanyan's Mashetsi bride, bride and the and infamous the case of the 14-year-old Guluzar, who was abducted, raped, raped, raped and forcibly converted to Islam by the by Kurdish Ashiret chieftain Musabeg, whose extraordinary trial in 1889 had become an international cause celebre. So, so this, this, this trial, trial, I mean, she survived, survived um, and she was reunited with her family, family and, uh, and uh, Musabek was taken to court. It was a show trial, but there was a court case. So 66 Armenian um, uh, village headmen traveled um, to Constantinople to testify against Musabek. And um, the 14-year-old um, uh, Gulizar as well um, stood in a court of law and basically testified against him. Um, which is quite an extraordinary thing, not expected in the Ottoman Empire um, of that particular period. So, traveling to Constantinople, the freed young Gulizar had faced her abductor in a court of law, 
who is also accused um, on numerous counts of murder and pillage. Introducing her image, probably derived from a family photograph taken in 1889 during the trial in Constantinople and printed for sale to help cover the expenses of her journey to testify. So there was fundraising to basically pay for Gulizar to come to um, Constantinople to testify. Um, uh, sort of into, uh, so introducing her into the discourse acts um, as a metaphorical unveiling, in my mind, of Nishanyan's Mashetzi bride. With her direct and unflinching gaze, Gulizar, in, this, in these photographic images, hands clasped together like those of the bride, exudes an aura of resistance and signifies hope. The image captures the agency of a young peasant girl surviving to resist and challenge abuse at the local level and furthermore enduring the limelight of a public trial in Constantinople under the watchful eye of the Ottoman and foreign press. Even Gladstone in the UK sort of wrote about this case. So it was, it was, it was, a, it was a big deal. So, so this is this how is the how historical the moment, moment which, which, which saw the Ottoman states, states already tense relationship, relationship with its Armenian population and the precarious the situation um, in, the in the Ottoman East, Ottoman um, uh, taking, taking an especially, especially perilous turn by 1890, and of, and of which, which Gulizar's traumatic experience was just one single signifier, would impinge upon the painting, draining much of the wedding's celebratory aura. This is reflected in Pashalyan's sober tone and which indicates a sadness that permeates his view of the painting. And he notes, and I, I quote, and so contemplate for a while longer and you become emotional, touched by intense feelings stirred up from the depth of your heart. The artist has attained his goal for he has awakened that tiny emotive nerve, nerve thread that jolts your entire body and your hand, guided by instinct, surges for the hand of the artist to express with a firm burning squeeze that which the lips are unable to convey." End of quote. So why otherwise would a painting representing a wedding, a festive occasion, trouble Pashalyan's heart to such an extent that could only be expressed with a firm burning squeeze of the artist's hand that the lips would be unable to convey? What aura of sadness emanating from the image itself had extinguished the painting's initial promise? Was Nishanyan perhaps suggesting that the salvation of eternal Armenia lay upon the pillars of its timeless traditions, signified by the wealth of ethnographic um, detail, its faith, uh, signified by the dome of the ancient, ancient church, and its will for survival by clinging onto the land, signified by the fortress and the peasant? I mean, can we, Can we project, project into this painting? Can we, do we read this? Do the contemporaries sort of read this painting as an allegory? So had Nishanyan's really celebration of a wedding also become an allegorical image of Armenian suffering? The, art, the article, A Provincial Wedding, that was, that was the title of, 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 of uh, Pashalyan's article, was published less than a fortnight after the Kumkapir affray of the 15th of July, 1890, which had seen the desperate situation in Ottoman Armenia rear its violent head on the streets of the Ottoman capital for the first time. The passions of the predominantly Bantov crowd had been fueled by the pessimism surrounding the reform issue, lack of reform, um, the lack of recourse for justice exemplified recently by the acquittal of Ashura chieftain Musa Beg during his show trial in Constantinople, and the agitation for the first time of a Hunchak cell. Hunchak was a, um, a Russian-Armenian um, fringe party at this point who were basically established in Geneva in 1887, and in 1890 they basically started making their first inroads into Constantinople, and they weren't particularly uh, successful in getting Constantinople Armenians um, to sort of um, to, to, to support them, but they did find some support among the Bantots, mostly the Hamas from Ottoman Armenia. So whilst it is striking, nevertheless it is unsurprising that Pashalyan's review avoids the use the use of the term Armenia, or even perhaps in an act of self-censorship, even refer to the locality of Mush. So the word Armenia, or the word Mush, is not mentioned anywhere in Pashalyan's huge review of the, of the, of the painting. In Arpiarians, you do find it, but then again, that was published in Tiflis in the Russian Empire, so one could use the word Armenia, whereas in the Ottoman Empire, you couldn't. So stricter censorship regulations had already, especially since 1888, introduced further controls on the use of forbidden historical and geographical names. That's, that's, that's what they were sort of termed as, forbidden historical and geographical names. And, and they included Macedonia and Armenia. 
But as we saw before, I mean, there were numerous articles published in the Istanbul press, in the Constantinople press, which referred to Armenia and Armenian customs, etc. But after 1888, and especially after 1890, the word vanished, it, it disappeared. So Armenia became Kurdistan. It is only when read within the context of this increasingly repressive environment and the violence on the streets of Constantinople that one begins to properly comprehend Pashalyan's response to Nishanyan's wedding. His emotional timber exposes an inability to freely express his um, interpretation of the painting in print. Well, he couldn't express his, his, his views on, on the painting in print openly, despite having been privy to the artist's own thoughts. And, and I wish I was a fly on the wall when the two of them were in that room in front of that painting. I, I, I can just imagine um, the, the conversation that basically took place. So that Pashalyan and Arpiarian had not encountered the wedding on show in a glamorous shop window on the prestigious Grand Rue de Pera, but instead on limited view in a back room at the warehouse of a firm of commissionaires, the Castigian Frères, known foremost as Oriental rag exporters uh, to the United States in the bazaar is very telling. It strongly suggests that a public exhibition of such a painting, an Armenian painting, would not have been tolerated in that political environment in a public space. So having not found a buyer in Constantinople, and um, the suggestion by R.P. Arian is that um, no one would touch this painting. They would come and view it, but they would not touch it. Um, the wedding would soon be on its way to the United States, probably Pashalyan notes, to grace some wealthy American salon. Pashalyan's closing paragraph laments the painting's forthcoming departure, an almost um, it's like an exile from Constantinople. Uh, the notion of the painting's exile provides an appropriate metaphor for and prefigures the imminent mass, imminent mass exodus of Armenians of all social classes from the city um, that would also include the artist and um, the two reviewers. So, 1894 to 1896 massacres, um, thousands of Armenians fled the city or were expelled, um, thousands were killed, and um, Nishanyan moved on to the Transcaucasus, uh, to Tiflis, um, and Pashalyan and Arpiarian escaped as well. Uh, so the whereabouts of Nishanyan's painting, Armenian Wedding in Mush, are currently unknown. We don't know where it is. A letter from Chicago, um, an article called um, A Letter from Chicago, Armenian Artists at an Oriental Exhibition, Namak Chicago, Hai Arve Saket, Abevelian, Susante Simamech, published in Arevelk um, in October 1892, confirms that two years after Pashalyan's encounter with the paint, painting, it, it was um, still in the uh, pos uh, possession of the Costigian Frères, having been awarded pride of place at their annual Oriental Rug Grand Sale Exposition in Chicago. And I quote, in this oriental exhibition, the most eye-catching objects for uh, American women are a silk Persian rug woven on both sides with various colors and pictures and an oil painting of Mr. G. Nishanyan, nine feet in length and five feet in width, showing a wedding ceremony. The colors were so harmonious and the picture was executed with such skill that to be honest brings, honest to, brings honor to the Armenian artist, end of quote. So as the wedding, the wedding vanished, vanished from public, public view, view in Constantinople in 1890. Within, Within a decade, decade its mediated image, image began um, um, to appear yeah, in print outside the Ottoman Empire. Empire. In 1899, in 1899 it, was it was published in the Tiflis, Tiflis journal Taldron uh, with the caption Wedding of Mushetsis, Mushetsot Tarsanik. And in 1901, in the Machitarist Art and Culture journal Keroni in Venice, captioned Wedding in Daron, Hassanik Daron Image. Its reproduction in the French Orientalist um, Frédéric Mackler's La France et l'Arménie um, uh, in, uh, in 1917 as, ma as uh, mariage arménien à mouche, mar Armenian marriage in, in, in mouche, might suggest that this indeed would have been Nishanyan's um, intended or preferred title for the work because Mackler knew Nishanyan and Nishanyan had moved to Paris by then and it was Nishanyan who supplied um, an image to Mackler who then published the image, who produced the image. So, so um, um, the current the life, life of, 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 of the painting, it appears on covers of books. And it's also on the Armenian Genocide Museum website as a marriage um, in Tokat, which is obviously wrong. And it's credited as being in Project Save. But the little cut, the little tear at the corner basically 
tells me that it is the very image that I found in, in the Nubarian library. So um, um, the last time I checked it was, was last night, so it's still sort of um, mislabeled. So it, it has an afterlife. The image has, 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 has an afterlife. So my attempts to locate the painting have so far not yielded much. So um, I had this great idea of putting the image on Facebook and tagging everyone I knew and all my scholar friends, all my, all my friends, etc. And everybody sort of shared the image, it went round and round and round, it was everywhere. And eventually I started getting emails saying, there's this guy who's looking for this painting and we thought you would be the person who would know. So eventually, so I know I am the person who's looking for the painting. So eventually, my question ended up sort of coming back to me. So, and I still haven't been able to sort of find it. So um, I suspect very much um, it remains hidden in a private collection um, to which art historians have no access. Um, I also suspect it's probably in the United States. If it still exists, it's still in the United States. I mean, if you have this painting at home, you would definitely know that you had it. So um, you can't, you can't sort of miss it. So, um, yet despite, yet despite the, absence the absence of the original, original painting, painting uh, the image's various mediated, mediated incarnations, incarnations have maintained the presence of uh, Garabit Charles Nishanyan's Armenian wedding in Mush across time and space. Like many other visual representations of Ottoman Armenians and Ottoman Armenia, Nishanyan's image refuses to fade away. So, in conclusion, Nishanyan's Armenian wedding in Mush is a work by a respected artist intellectual painted at the height of his fame whose Western art education and thorough grounding in academic painting come through clearly in its conceptualization, composition, and execution. We know that Nishanyan labored on the work for several years, and unusually for a commercial artist worked, uh, working in late 19th century Constantinople, appears to have produced it outside traditional channels of patronage. The length of time spent and the work's monumental scale indicate its evident importance to the artist importance of the image to the artist, who, as R.P. Aryan and Pasharyan confirm, had spared no effort in researching, contemplating, and striving towards the accomplishment of a truthful image of a traditional Armenian wedding set in Ottoman Armenia. Yet whatever Nishanyan's initial uh, conceptions, during the long process of the work's execution, the, sh the shift in the socio-political environment had necessarily crept into the content of the work and colored how it was received. Conceived as an impressive tour de force of ethnographic gaiety in 1886, in 1886, by the time of its completion and clandestine, was clandestine showing um, in a warehouse three and a half years later in 1890, the painting had been seen, um, uh, it, had, it had earned the admiration of only a few privileged individuals. As such, the wedding provides an insightful barometer of its specific historical moment. Thank you very much. I hope I haven't talked too much. Thank you. I'd like to invite the opportunity for any questions. Yay, questions. Hi, thank you. Um, thank did you. I mishear that possibly the last actual viewing of this painting was in Chicago? It was, it was yes. yes. Oh, right. It was in a carpet shop, in a rug shop. Oh, okay. So they had this sort of annual sort of show. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a company of, of importers, exporters, the costly gans. They actually still exist today um, in New York, in the New York area. And um, it was in their possession. They took it to America. Uh, it was meant to have been sold, but it was still in their possession. Um, and since then, we have absolutely no idea what happened And what was that year? It was 1892 or 1893, okay. I think. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. It was just so before just the um, uh, uh, Chicago uh, Colombian right. um, exhibition. So, uh, that's why I think that's why I was mixing it, that it was in the. Ex it, wasn't, it wasn't. It wasn't. That was. That was. That was, that was I, I got really excited when I read that. Sort of. I thought, oh my God, yes, it was shown at the. Exhibit. But it wasn't. It was. It was shown in a in a rug store. But it was a. It was, it was a really prestigious sort of um, rug store, the Costi Gianfres and all the rest. And I. Um, I. Um, I found, I found the details, the details of, of the granddaughter of the original Costigan, who was in her 80s, and I sort of called her up and I said, I asked her, I sent her an email with a, with a picture of the painting, and she said, um, I have absolutely no recollection of this work at all, and she was going to ask her cousins, etc., but I haven't heard back. But um, perhaps it's in the family, perhaps they don't want people to know it is in the family, who knows? Who knows where it is? 
Um, Harag Vartanian of Hyperallergic basically thinks that it might be with one of the um, oldest sort of wealthy Armenian families on the East Coast in their collections. Um, but who knows? One day it will come out. It will come out, I'm sure. Thank you. I think, I think I think Rupin's, Rupin's got, got the mic, the mic and, and I think I think, I think, I think you have to hold the mic to ask questions. questions so yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Could you talk about what happened to him after the genocide? Because it, you, it indicated that he died in 1950. Did he stay in Constantinople, Istanbul, or did he go? Nishanyan. Yeah. Well, yeah. well it's, it's it's interesting. interesting. Nishanyan um, left, um, left Constantinople, Constantinople in 1894, 1894 which, is which is very very surprising, surprising because he was, was at the height of his fame. He was. People were, People were writing, writing poems, poems about this man. I mean, he's, he's, he's uh, all, the society, all the society, all the big Istanbul, Istanbul families, the Nora Dungians, yeah. were commissioning uh, uh, huge uh, portraits, portraits, family portraits, portraits you know, you by, know him. by him. And then, and then 1994, 1994, he goes, he goes to, to Russian, Russian Transcaucasia in Tiflis. Tiflis. Then we then find we him in Vladi Kafkas, um, sort of um, producing religious paintings for a church, for a Georgian church. And there was outrage by Georgian artists that the work had been commissioned to an Armenian, to an Armenian artist, artist and not a Georgian artist. artist. Um, there are, there several, are several works, works that he actually produced, produced um, in, um, in the Transcaucasus. Um, several, several of his works, works were, were exhibited, exhibited in the Fifth Caucasian, Caucasian Art Exhibition, exhibition in 1897, 1897 in Tiflis. And, and um, two reviewers, um, uh, Yevan Lalayans and, and Alexander Shivanzade, uh, the, um, um, the novelist, uh, wrote uh, reviews right, of the exhibition, and they both they highlighted Nishanyan's works as among uh, the, uh, best the best works. works. And, and we just happened to have, have um, a couple of these images. Um, uh, so, so the first, first one is Namakata, the reading of the letter. Of the, letter. Um, uh, uh, the, the first the version is a larger version, which is in the National Gallery in Armenia, and there's a smaller version that the artist made in 1898 as well. And then Head of an Armenian Man, which... This painting sort of received, um, uh, it was really, really, really praised. And um, so anyway, there's a story about this particular painting. But going back to Nishanyan, um, then he may have gone to Paris, uh, sorry, to Egypt. We don't know. Gary Kupman notes that he may have gone to Egypt, uh, but there's no sources um, about him being there. Um, and maybe stopped in Constantinople. There's a reference to his studio address in 1907 in the Annuaire Oriental. And then he turns out in Paris. So um, there is a painting in the um, Armenian Museum of France. Um, of the Esmerian family. I think it was the Esmerian family. It's a group of children of a family. It's a large portrait that he painted. And um, I found two um, uh, uh, drawings of um, uh, sort of Ottoman Armenians um, on eBay um, about a year ago, um, dated 1909. And that is the latest date that basically we hear of him. He just completely vanishes. He disappears. And in 1917, when Makler published his, um, his, his uh, France and Armenia, um, there is maybe a 50, 60 word, word biographical note about him uh, by Makler. And, um, the, and the wedding is basically reproduced, um, is, 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 is reproduced um, in, in, in the volume. But Nishanyan just really, 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 um, I have not been able to find out what happened to him where he went, he just seems to have stopped producing work. I mean, there's no works by him after 1909. I mean, we only know about 20, 24 paintings by him, all in all. So, but he was a prolific artist, so he must have produced lots of works. And these works, once in a while, sort of pop up on eBay, at auction. So, who knows? There's a few, there's a few paintings in the National Gallery of Armenia, thank goodness. So, um, he's one of the few Ottoman Armenian artists of that period of whom, of whom we actually, we actually have some have works, works in, in Yerevan. Yerevan. So, so, but, but yeah, he yeah, wasn't, he wasn't there, there during the genocide. genocide. And, uh, but where is he buried? Don't know. We don't know, but we know the year. We know, the, well, well, we're not we're sure, sure whether that year is absolutely, absolutely correct. correct. That, that's, that's the year that, that uh, Kirkman reproduces. So that's, that's the date they are, that, that basically I have used. So um, maybe at some point when, when the book's out and I've got more time, etc., I can sort of just go back, back into, into looking, looking out, out for him. him. But, but um, in the 1880s, 1880s and, and um, up to the, the mid-1890s, 
um, Nishanyan was a hugely famous artist. No one remembers it today, unfortunately. Um, it's, 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 it's very academic, it's very sort of realist. His work is very academic, very realist. And, and you know, at the same time, you know, we have the Impressionists and we have the post-Impressionists. So, you know, art history goes in a particular direction and ignores certain types of, of work. And, of course, not being a Western European artist and, and coming from the Middle East, again, he's sidelined as well. So. But I, I feel that he's a very important artist. And if you want to think about um, late 19th century Ottoman Armenian, Social, social history, history and art history, you can't, you can't not talk about um, Garabek and Shanyan. I even I found um, um, the, um, the, um, the studio, studio, the building, building and, and it's been under renovation for at least five, six years. Every year when I go to Istanbul, I basically go and sort of take exactly the same pic picture of, 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 of um, the building, which is basically covered up as being renovated. But if anyone out there, because I think, are we on Zoom? We're on Zoom, right? We Live stream. We're live streamed. Oh, li oh right. Okay. So, um, you know, if we are, if anyone out there knows where the painting is, or has any more information about Nishanyan, please drop me a line. Thank you. Is the camera there? I think it was. Yeah. Um, you said you you saw the original uh, album in print in uh, Nobar Library. Yes. yes. Was it made in Constantinople? Yes. It was. It was. It was incredible because I. I'm an ex-lawyer who basically moved to art history late in life. And so um, some of the, um, I started doing research about 10, 12 years ago, uh, in 2010. Um, and so I spent most of my time in Paris at the Nubarian Library because they've got this almost full um, sort of set of uh, newspapers um, published in the Ottoman Empire, in Armenian newspapers published in the Ottoman Empire, um, the, Ottoman Empire um, the last two decades of the, um, of the 19th century. So, so I spent, I spent about, six about six months going, going through, through, you know, in these papers, in these newspapers from 1884 until about 1896. Um, and, and I came across, across this article, Kavaragan Stigma, a provincial wedding. And I was really stunned. I was really shocked because I'd never seen um, a review of a painting, which was just so extensive. And it was hugely, hugely descriptive. And, of course, I had no idea what the painting looked like, where, 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 where it was, etc. Um, a couple of days later, I thought, okay, I'm going to stop working on the newspapers. I'm just going to go into their sort of photographic sort of archives. I've got boxes of photographs. And there was a box saying group photographs. And um, so I opened it, and it was like group photographs of Armenians, etc. And then suddenly I came across this photograph. Um, and um, which is... Let's have the photograph. Why not? Um, and I looked at it, and it basically at the back it said "Mariage Armenian, Armenian wedding." There's no mention of artists. I said, "This is a photograph of a painting. This is a photograph of the painting that I read the review about." You know, it's just one of those eureka moments that um, you know, and, uh, uh, when a scholar sort of comes across and sort of, you know, it was it was incredible. It was serendipitous. So, um, but yeah, it's it's it was just this random photograph. Misplaced in, 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 in the wrong box, so that I accidentally stumbled on. I mean, there's no reason why I would basically be looking at group photographs. I was just there. It is. But coming across the review and then and then the image in a couple within a couple of days was just incredible. I would say. Are there any final questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Davidian, for such Thank an insightful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Uh, we now would like to invite everyone downstairs for a reception and some wine and treats. Thank you. Thank you for everything. <laughs>